Hi guys, welcome back to my channel and welcome to another episode of the Be Different series. In today's episode, we will be talking about what is a trigger and how do we deal with triggers or when we're triggered. And to help us with that, we have a very special guest all the way from Australia. I actually admire this person. She is one of the people that I admire and look up to because she is such an amazing person and the work that she does is, 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 is equally amazing as she is as a person. <laughs> she is actually a psycho-spiritual coach, emotional peer initiator, and a certified spiral practitioner at Becoming Triggerless, which you will know more about later. Let's welcome Tara Suyo! <laughs> Hi guys! Welcome, 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 welcome. Before we mm -hmm. continue, just a quick background of what Be Different is all about and also to the new viewers, if you're a new viewer, welcome, welcome, welcome. So Be Different is an advocacy of mine. It's all about self-love, embracing and celebrating uniqueness and differences and also being brave to committing to loving oneself in any way or form. I wanted to share this topic because I feel that it's important that we take care of our emotional and mental well-being as well. Also, I feel that it's important to connect and acknowledge your feelings or what you actually feel, you know. A lot of problems in our life occur because we're not connected to our feelings. We're not connected to our truths and our feelings is like a, a guiding tool to ourselves can help us understand if something's wrong or if things are doing great. That's what our emotions are here for. So if you're not connected to your emotions, you're never going to be connected to yourself, ever. And if you're not connected to yourself, you can't form healthy relationship externally because then you can't actually give something you don't have. So if you're not having the connection, the intimate connection with yourself, you're not going to be able to give that to someone else. So yeah, super duper duper important. Though. So many problems can be solved if people can learn how to healthily express their emotions, feel and understand their emotions deeply, not run away from them, not push it down. Because if you push it down, it will just manifest in other ways. It will, it's like, it's like trying to cover shit. Oops, sorry, am I, am I allowed to say that? <laughs> it's like covering shit, yeah. but like tissue. It's still there, it's still gonna stink. <laughs> True. <laughs> And you're still gonna know, other people are gonna know that it's there. You're gonna have to deal with the actual shit and clean it up. That's, that, yeah, that's, that's, sorry, that's not a great example, but, but yeah, that's, yeah, you deal with your real emotions. What is trigger? In this context of psychology, a trigger is an object, a person, a visual representation, a sound, any stimulus that you have or that you can experience that activates past memories or past traumas. That is the more technical way of understanding what trigger is. But obviously, in our modern day, <laughs> we overuse the term being triggered. And so now, in a more layman perspective, you can get activated or triggered when you have an experience that's unpleasant that is bringing up yeah. Unpleasant emotions. So now we define what trigger is, Sarah. What are the steps or how do we deal with triggers? First of all, you really have to acknowledge that you're feeling a certain way, uh, that you're feeling intensely emotional. And most of the time, you would have physiological signs. Our body is naturally going to show the signs that you are feeling activated, stressed, or angry, or upset, or scared, or fearful. Because your body doesn't actually know if a threat is real in real life or if it's just imagined. And that's why it becomes a trigger because it activates that experience previously where you felt threatened, where the threat was actually real. And sometimes the threats are even the, the threat or the pattern that was being activated can even be genetic. For example, like if we see a snake even if you're someone who has zero experience around snakes as we evolved as a species we kind of understood that some snakes are dangerous and so instinctively in our genes in our genetic makeup we kind of understand that that's a threat so we will have triggers around snakes we do have uh, in our genetic makeup some sort of backup information that we can access 
to know whether something is threatening or not. So in the same way, as we grow up, like when we gather information as we grow up and we form our belief systems and based on our experiences, simple things like, for example, if it's raining really hard and at that moment you did something wrong because you got scared, panicked and broke a vase. And then your mom or your caretaker got angry and hit you with a stick. In that event, multiple associations can happen. The rain, the stick, making mistakes, crying, fear. They're, they can all get mixed up in this messy web of association of experience. And so the rain, if that was a really traumatic situation, the rain can act as a trigger. Even if it's just a subtle trigger, it can be that the person would just suddenly feel a bit anxious when it's raining. And he doesn't know why, because he's forgotten about that experience when he was young, without knowing that a part of his anxiety is actually coming from that previous experience getting activated in his body. All the fears, all the the remembering of the, the punishment, the mistake that they did, the rejection they felt. And that, and we as people, we as a human being, as an adult, you have so many subtle triggers that you don't even know about. Things that you dislike. And it's a really interesting route and activity of getting to know yourself better if you start confronting things that you don't like. How do you deal with it is again after acknowledging that you are feeling blank. If you are if you can be specific with emotion that's good. You acknowledge it for the sake of yourself and for the sake of other people who might be there with you so that you don't act out and they get weirded out about it. Once you acknowledge it and tell other people that you're feeling a certain way, they can extend some support and hold space for you while you are expressing your emotion. Once you acknowledge by saying it verbally, then you go into your body. You connect, and this is really powerful, you connect to the actual physical experiences inside of you, physiological response that you're getting. And identify as much as you can in how you're feeling physically. You can say, my heart beat is beating really fast and my chest really hurts right now, it's really tight. Like I can't breathe properly, it's not even warm right now but I'm sweaty or I'm shivering. So acknowledging the symptoms one by one, it kind of is a way of like also honoring the experience that it's there. You're acknowledging it, you're not pushing it away, you're not running away from it, you're acknowledging it. That on its own is already hopefully going to support you calming down because it, um, if we don't acknowledge the emotion, it's just right at, it's at the back of our head and we become more anxious that there's something going on that we're not fully understanding. But when we acknowledge and bring it forward, then you see and understand what you're dealing with. So it reduces the anxiety and helps you ground yourself again. And then you decide if you have the time, space, and energy to be dealing with the emotion right now or if you can't. And there are so many reasons why you can't. Maybe you're at work, maybe you're in a public place, maybe you're talking to clients or your boss or like someone really important and you don't want to lash out at them, right? That's really not professional yeah. in, in other people's perspectives. If you feel like you have to control and manage your emotions, so then other things you can do would be excusing yourself and having a walk, a change of state, and you're doing this consciously versus just walking out, slamming the door. You're simply taking your time for yourself. For yourself. Exactly. And so, uh, to also not disrespect the people around you, you also let them know. And again, you first acknowledge, hmm, I can feel something coming up for me. I am gonna need a moment right now, so please excuse me, guys. I'll be back in a second. When you're out, what you're gonna do is drink water, uh, have a splash of cold water on your face. It's gonna actually really help, literally help calm your nerves down. Because when you're stressed, parts of your brain kind of freezes. When you're stressed, like your IQ drops because different parts of the brain get activated and freezes up. Like the prefrontal cortex, um, it kind of stops working. Not fully, but it kind of freezes up. Like parts of it freezes up. And then your amygdala becomes hyperactive, which is the emotional part of the brain, the amygdala. And it's also the primitive part of the brain. Again, responsible for the survival, the stress, and the flight or flight responses right there. You want to bring yourself back to this to the logical, rational part. The, the ingredient that's most helpful is breathing. So I've talked about this many times, but one of the simplest ways to just really regain control of your body and your autonomic nervous system and bring yourself back from the stressed state to the relaxed state is by controlling your breathing. Because your your physical body is inter, like, 
it's overlapping with your emotions. You cannot change your body without influencing your emotions. In the same way, your emotions cannot be felt without your physical body being influenced. Since you cannot control your emotions at that time, what can you control? Your body. So you use your body, you use your breathing. So the uh, one of the best ways to use the box breathing, you write a box, imaginary box in the air, and when you draw the line upwards, you inhale. And you inhale in the count of four, four. One, two, three, four. And then when you uh, draw horizontally, you pause. So you're not exhaling right away. So you inhale, pause, and then exhale, pause. Four counts each side. And if you feel like that's too short and you're still not calming down, yeah. and you have kind of developed that skill already, move it up to six counts, then move it up to eight counts. The longer your breathing is, the calmer your body will become. Easy way, if you don't want to do the box, is the four, five, six method. Inhale four, hold for five, exhale for six. There are so many like resources around breathwork, and breathwork is a really good practice for you to have to, com um, to complement meditation if you're into that kind of thing. So breathing is one of the most natural thing we do, but it's under used, underutilized in terms of helping us manage our emotions and our well-being. There's also the other option of, yes, you can process the emotions right now because I was um, explaining how you can help kind of manage your state when you're triggered and you can fully process the emotions, right? Because those things that you did, it's not actually fully going to address whatever it is that it's got you yourself. triggered. You were just composing yourself yeah. to be able to function throughout the day. Make sure that you, if you do that, if you took that option of not processing the emotions right away, make sure that you actually allot time when you're back home or when you're out with friends or when, when it's safe to then properly address your emotions. That is where a lot of people miss out on. And that's really important. I really like that term. Schedule a time to be angry. Find time in your day, ideally within 24 hours, for you to actually reconnect with that experience and then process what happened. How do you process? You wake your energy up, you can recall the, the, the situation that made you really angry, and then you can punch a pillow, you can jump around and release the extra energy because it's really intense emotion. This is all about moving the energy that was there. Yeah. Um, Physical movement is really powerful because when you are feeling triggered or you got really stressed or scared, your body has just released adrenaline and cortisol. And that is going to be stored in your bum and in your legs because your body was preparing you to, again, run away. Going back, you know, to the primitive era where yeah. there's threat, you have to run away from the threat. Mm -hmm. But in the modern world, we don't actually run. So we have to do that. We actually have to move our body. You want to be using the adrenaline that was just released into your bloodstream. You don't want that to get stuck. You mentioned that ways to transfer this negative energy is through breathing and movements. Yes. Am I right? Breathing, movement, yeah. And then the last tool that you can use is sound. So there's three tools, breath, sound, and movement. So the sound is the screaming that I mentioned earlier. Or if you want, you can sing. You can do KTV. <laughs> <laughs> or just because you can ah, something like that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's why when people are angry, they scream, they yeah. shout at their partners. Mm -hmm. It's 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 kind of a reflex. So people do that. They just raise their voices. But it's the two birds in one stone because you're kind of like expressing yourself and releasing it, but at the same time, there's a desire to like vibrate your throat, your vagus nerve, and to stimulate that to calm you down. But it's not as effective as when you're actually consciously humming or chanting. Like when you know when people meditate and they chant, like mm, that specific vibration in here is really helpful in restoring the relaxed state in your body. I'll, I'll be happy to give the audience like links on further readings about the vagus nerve, about the stress response, the autonomic nervous system. You don't really need to understand all of that. Just know that everything I'm saying actually has scientific proof to yeah. back it up. Thank you so much, Sarah, for sharing your your wisdom and knowledge regarding the topic. Hope you guys find that very useful. Please share about becoming triggerless and where can we find you? 
my page is called Becoming Sugarless. It's a funny name. It's a, it started as a joke, but you can just search it on Facebook. Becoming actually Sugarless. Catchy. Mm. Yeah, I know, right? It's really cute. It's like <laughs> Becoming Limitless, but actually it's Becoming Sugarless. And uh, I want to share something about that. There is no one fixed destination. You can never become triggerless. So it's uh, it's kind of a, the idea is that you will always be a work in progress. And you have to enjoy the journey of becoming triggerless. That's not, that's why it's not become sugarless. It's becoming sugarless. It's a continuous process of healing and learning, relearning, and then learning again, and then relearning again. Why do you want to work on your own emotional resilience and your own ability to become sugarless? It's because you don't want to be controlled by external situations or external stimulus or stimuli in, in terms of how you feel. Ideally, you feel good regardless of what's going on. Ideally. But we're human and that's not gonna happen. <laughs> we're not gonna be happy 24-7, 365 days a year. And that's okay too. However, what we can do is we can rely more in our internal state instead of relying on external events or situations and just getting triggered all the time. So in the journey of becoming triggerless, you kind of reduce all your buttons that are sore that people can push. You kind of like remove all the sore points that people can push because if, if people know how to push you they can manipulate you or control you some people do and you don't want that if you want to be empowered and you want to feel ready for whatever is going to happen in your life and you want to enjoy life then you want as much control in yourself in your internal state as much as possible so working on yourself is probably the best form of self-love i agree it's so powerful so for people who are asking if i work one-on-one -on -one with people yes i do i put people through a, a journey for two to three months it's called the spiral journey and i also do a self-work and self-mastery journey with people so if you're interested you can go to my website it's sarahsuyong.com or just go to the page and send me a message i also have an instagram at triggerless life that's it anyone who would have any questions don't uh, hesitate to like put a comment and i'll be happy to still support the questions and give insights such an honor thank you for having me <laughs> you're so cute thank you so much for having me be brave be different and be different <laughs> <laughs>